Hi, everyone. Welcome to Fortnite's Molecular Machines Group. I'm very, very happy to be joined by so many of you here in the audience and then by Alexi to give a presentation today to our group on DNA electromotors. Before that, I can't help but remind you for one piece of housekeeping, which is that if you haven't applied to join our Foresight's Molecular System Design Workshop this September, then please do so. Applications are relatively filling up, but there's still some space. And so if you do want to come, especially on a reduced ticket and so forth, now is a really, really great time to apply. If you want to get a taste for what we will be doing there, you can also link to our 2022 workshop and watch a few of the wonderful presentations that we had for many people that are also here in this group. So without further ado, I'm going to just post the link here in the chat. And now I will hand it over to Alexei to discuss his work on DNA electromotors. And you've written a wonderful transcript, which I'll also share here in the chat. So thank you so, so much for joining. We're really, really excited to have you here. And the stage is yours. All right. Thanks so much for having me here. Is everything working? All right. Looks great. Looks great. Amazing. Okay. So let me first kind of give you an intro of what my lab does. We are specializing in high-end simulations of various biomolecular and nanotechnological systems like biological organelles. You'll hear about it from Abby in a week or so. We're looking at viruses, particularly the structure of the genomes, nuclear pore complexes, artificial water channels, biological condensates, and of course, nanopores for DNA and protein sequencing. So all of that is kind of what we do. I'm not going to talk about it. So my interest in nanotechnology came really from, from this. We were interested in using nanotechnology as an interface to talk to biology. So the idea is, uh, of course, compelling because if you look at the scale of features that you can make with conventional silicon technology, it's, it's about the right size, five nanometers, which is about the size of a, of, a, of a small protein in a biological cell. The problem, of course, is that those systems that we can make using conventional technology, they although they have similar size, they operate in different environments. They're made in vacuum and in high quality air and they work in air, but biology works in salty water. So we can also look at it from a different perspective, like is biology actually the ultimate nanotechnology? I would argue that actually, yes, right now it's probably the only way we can make nanotechnological objects in 3D. And there was a, a lot of interest in using biological self-assembly to make nanotechnological systems. And there has been tremendous progress in the field of protein design. And you've heard of, about it from Alexis a few weeks ago. So I will talk about one particular molecule that is used to build DNA, as it used to build a nanomachine. It's the molecule of DNA. So as you know, in biology, DNA carries the information to manufacture pretty much everything you need to build a cell. And uh, in brief, the unit cell of a DNA molecule is a DNA nucleotide, which has a base, a sugar, and a phosphate. So the phosphate is negatively charged under normal conditions. That will become important to designing things out of DNA. So the DNA nucleotides are forming single-stranded DNA, which differ by the sequence. So the sequence is really the difference in a few atoms. So in a way, DNA nanotechnology is written in, in, in atoms. So the molecules of DNA form a double-stranded helix where A pairs with T and C pairs with G. So the size of the DNA is about two nanometers across and the precision, so to say, as you go along the DNA molecule is about 0.3 nanometers. So how can we build things with DNA? So the idea is kind of simple. So if you start with double strand DNA, you can rearrange molecules to build a so-called holiday junction. So that's you have four DNA molecules that come together. They're held together by a complementary interaction. And then you can, of course, do it with nice strands and so on. And that's basically how you invent DNA nanotechnology, which is what Nat Simon did many, many years ago. So the field kind of started off with inventing DNA origami, which was later made accessible by 
Sean Douglas in WMC's she's lab who put together the wonderful design tool, the CAD Nano, which made it easy for everyone to, to design origami systems. So here's my kind of lapse animation of what, how origami works. Um, you start with a strand of a, a long strand of DNA, and then you add staple strands to bring parts of the genomes that are not in immediate proximity into immediate proximity. So basically you hybridize those parts of DNA. You add enough staple strands to bring, to cover the entire genome, and then you gradually cool down a mixture and that will self-assemble into whatever you want. In this particular case, it's the logo of the University of Illinois. And the method works, of course, wonderfully, as was demonstrated by many luminaries in the field for the designs, and those are the actual structures. So it's all good. Now, my lab specializes in high-end computational microscopy of systems. So what is it? So our instrument is shown here on the left, which used to be one of the best supercomputers in the world. Now it's already decommissioned, Blue Waters. So we use software and physical model to build whole atom models of various systems. And we animate them in time by solving equations of motion at the end, obtaining kind of a dynamic description of what happens. Like in this case, you're looking at the DNA molecule going through silicon nitride pore. Of course, we can do it because the field has invested a lot of resources into developing molecular force field and software. In particular, the software that is developed here at Illinois VMD and VMD that has many users worldwide. So... Back to DNA and nanomachines, it's of course not a new idea. Back when experiment has demonstrated that like myosin, myosin motors work on actin filaments or kinesin works on microtubules. So it was a complementary idea in the field of DNA nanotech, so called DNA walkers, you know, where you move a DNA construct along the track by strand exchange reaction. So we have been interested in DNA origami system for a while. Here, we initially collaborated with Erlich Kaiser from Cambridge University to design various nanopore systems made of DNA. And there, I think the most interesting and potentially game-changing discovery was that, that if you insert a DNA structure into lipid membrane, it kind of connects the two leaflets of the bilayer, and that permits scrambling highly efficient scrambling of the lipid composition. So that's something, the enzymes that we develop here operate at many orders of magnitude more efficiently than a biological counterpart. And interestingly, you can in principle use it to induce apoptosis of cells. So that's something that is still apt to be shown, but looks very promising. Now, I will be talking the rest of my presentation about DNA electromotors. Of course, Everybody knows that electromotors are important. We have cars, mixers, hydroelectric plants, all of those wonderful things. And they all operate based on the following principle. So you usually have a coupling between a magnetic field and electric current. And that coupling permits applying torque to microscopic objects. Now, if you look at the nanoscale in biology, there aren't really that many examples of true electromotors, but the ones that they are are truly spectacular. So one here is a flow of one ATP synthase. In fact, it was the first project, first biophysics project that I did was trying to figure out how that thing works. And uh, we kind of know how it works now. Basically, it has two parts. One that is embedded in a, you know, in a lipid membrane and the other one that is exposed to solution. So the lipid membrane part is an electromotor, but the mechanism that it utilizes to generate torques has nothing to do with the mechanism that we use to, uh, to drive Tesla. So there we have a transport of ions that basically biases random motion of, of a big ring embedded in the, in the membrane. So this the water soluble part performs synthesis of the uh, of the ATP from ADP and phosphate. So I believe Henrik Dijks is going to speak in a few weeks. He'll probably cover our work on reproducing the functionality of of that, which he 
wonderfully showed. I will not talk about it at all. We, the other thing that the other motor that is highly prominently featured in all kind of talks is this bacterial flagellum motor. So that is the motor that powers a rotation that makes the bacterium swim. So there is flagellum, uh, it's a really fantastic assembly of many proteins parts, but at the heart of it, there is really a double membrane system that utilizes the gradient of electric and chemical potentials to drive the rotation of this big machine. So how well can we reproduce the function of biological motors using our conventional nanotechnology? First thing is that as we scale down, so first of all, it's really not possible to scale down our conventional electromotors to nanoscale. Uh, it's just the physics of it. The, the scaling laws are such that your torques that you generate, if you shrink down, the conventional design will be really small. So even if you want to manufacture something at sub-millimeter scale, you have to use different principles. For example, this torsional actuator from Sandia Lab, it, uh, so one piece of it is actually so-called a comb drive. So comb drive are those like two fabricated parts that come together in a part based on electrostatic interactions. So there is actually no magnetic field already at that scale. And of course it works well in air, but probably doesn't work in, in, in water. There have been a lot of efforts to use or to combine biological parts with synthetic parts. This was really, for me, a pioneering study by Carlo Montemango, where he used an F180 piece in taste, uh, attached the road and showed that if you feed it with ATP, it can hydrolyze ATP and kind of spin around. In the field of DNA origami design, there was also a lot of interest in, in using, in building rotary motors out of DNA. So the first one is from Henrik Diaz lab, which is a rotary apparatus. So it doesn't really make unidirectional rotation. It just is, it's an enclosure where that permits Brownian motion at the nanoscale. So here's our simulation of how it works. So you kind of have an enclosure, then you have a a rod to monitor the rotation and the rotation is stochastic. There was another work in 2018 that showed that one can use origami system to produce kind of unidirectional rotation if underneath you kind of have a system of channels and you basically steer this rotation by altering the flow through these channels. So we have been interested in designing systems from probably 2016. And this was actually the first design that, that Scott Michael, who back then was a student in my lab, made. So he looked at microscopic objects for inspiration. So, you know, one is the, the water mill. So here was his design. So you see there is this like a, a little pipette. And at the pipette, you have a, a, a plate made of origami, then you have a little hole there where the water will flow and a little mill that will spin as the water flows through it. So we had a, an undergrad student back in 2018 who tried to simulate this. And this is actually what happened in the simulations. We can make the model of the, of the nanopipette and of the origami, but it actually kind of didn't work. I mean, not that it didn't spin at all, but it basically the problem was that the origami plate is just too permeable. You know, that the thing that we drew here, this little hole with water flux, I mean, that's very nice to draw it, but the fact is the water flows very nicely through the origami without any holes, especially when it's driven by electric field, and, and that's kind of why we kind of abandoned the design. So what else is there? And of course, airplanes fly, so well, can we try to make an origami design using the propeller as a blueprint and here it is so when we apply electric field or subject to water flow well it didn't work basically the problem was the dna is too flimsy and what else is there is a turbofan propeller so we build actually this is also scott michael's design he designed it back in 2016 i think so here, the idea was that we stuck DNA helices in the, in the, in the form of, of this square lattice propeller. And that one actually worked. So regardless whether we apply electric field or we stimulate the flow, 
uh, rotation by, by applying a flow, it, it was shown to spin in directionally very nicely. But the only problem was that design was that it, it, it wasn't origami design, meaning that it was very difficult to make it fold an experiment, which is actually why we didn't publish it. Also, we should have probably. All right. But as well as we were thinking about the systems, it occurred to us hey, that, you know, DNA is actually chiral. So maybe it's possible that the nature has given us the tiniest turbine. Let's find out. So to do that, we took a piece of DNA, placed it in water, added salt, and then we did this little trick. So we used kind of a harmonic potential to make sure that the DNA doesn't fly away. And why we allow it to spin around if it wants in whatever direction. So a pyelectric field, and here's what happens. So DNA, the DNA rotates. So if you think about it, it rotates in the directions that you would expect it to due to its helical pitch. Interesting and importantly, if you don't apply electric field, it doesn't rotate. I mean, it still performs some a random motion. If you switch the direction of the electric field, it rotates in opposite direction. What else is helical? There are RNA molecules, also helical. So we tried to see if RNA would make an electric motor, and it does. Also, it spins with a different speed. It actually spins slower than the DNA molecule. What's the final test that kind of convinced us that it's all real was an LDNA. So LDNA is a synthetic construct. It's just like DNA, but it has the, the, the nucleotides basically are our mirror images. And uh, this way you can make a left-handed DNA spiral. And that one rotates as prescribed basically with the same speed as a normal DNA, but in the opposite direction. So one thing to note here is, is the speed of rotation. It is billions revolutions per minute. That's probably the fastest spinner ever that we know of. Now, with the molecular dynamic simulations, we can also measure directly the torque that is applied by the electric field on the DNA. So the way we do it, we just prevent the DNA helix from rotating. And the torque is actually pretty large. It, uh, it's a fraction of KT per base pair. But you know, if you multiply it by the number of base pairs, you can get pretty substantial torques from from just a few turns of DNA helix. So why does it work? What's the mechanism? So the mechanism is the following. The DNA is negatively charged. And because it's negatively charged, it is surrounded by counter ions. So the counter ions are not bound to DNA. They're just around there. But they are in water, which makes the fluid near the DNA positively charged. So when we apply electric field, we produce the motion of the fluid. and the fluid, the solvent, the water molecules will bounce off the surface of the DNA. And in this particular animation, molecules that bounce off clockwise are shown in blue and counterclockwise is shown in red. And you can kind of tell that you have more clockwise bounces than counterclockwise bounces, which basically transmits the impulse to the, to the molecule. So we can make it quantitative by computing the the, rise, the azimuthal velocity of the DNA at the surface. But this kind of this cartoon summarizes what happened. You have a water flow, it bounces off the surface of the DNA, produces reaction force, and that makes the DNA spin. So if this is true and it's driven by water flux, then we should be able to produce rotation of the DNA if you just apply water flux. And that's exactly what we did. So we constructed a system where the DNA is put in the water box. We apply small force to water molecules, producing water flux, and the DNA spins again in the direction prescribed by its chirality. And if we look at the simulations more precisely, we'll find that the torque produced by, by the water flux in our electric field or pressure driven simulations basically falls in the same line if you just put a plot, if we plot it as a function of axial water velocity at the surface of the DNA. All right, so how can we actually utilize this rotation for to making work if you want to make a propeller or if you want to make an autonomous a motor to, to, to propel a cell through a bloodstream or something like that. So, so here's our idea. Um, we place it in an anapod. 
And uh, to make it work, it was essential to make an nanopore that has smooth surface, such as the surface of a car carbon nanotube. So what you're looking at is a carbon nanotube that is fused with, with, with layers of graphene. So those actually can be manufactured and ex experimentally. And then again, we use our trick by constraining the DNA to the surface of a cylinder. And we apply really modest bias of about 200 millivolts. And the DNA spins again in the direction prescribed by its chirality. If we look at actual the rotation speed, it's about slightly less than a billion RPMs at this bias. And, you know, as always, we do multiple replica simulations of the same systems that we get consistent results. So in this particular case, we were able to estimate the efficiency of our, of transforming energy of electric field into rotation. So we used, we measured the electric current through the nanopore and then knowing the power dissipated and the torque produced by the DNA rotation, we could estimate the rotation as the efficiency to be at about 0.1%. Now you might think that 0.1% is actually not like 100% or not even 50%, that is a small number. It's actually a pretty big number for nanoscale systems. If you look at some of the systems that were put forward before the energy efficiency is like 10 to the minus 15 and so on. I think this is actually kind of promising because we did really nothing to optimize the system with regard to energy efficiency. It just came out to be like that. Now, our final design that we reported in the paper was this, that of a, of a kind of T-bar DNA. So in this particular case, we again have a slightly larger carbon nanotube and fused with graphene. So we have a DNA molecule and, and a bar on top of the DNA molecule. The bar ends with a dumbbell, so it was kind of essential because we have this nucleotides forming a contact with, with the graphene pores, which prevents it from flying away. And, and we apply electric field and, and it spins, and it spins in the direction prescribed by spirality. So in this particular simulation, we don't have any like restraints holding the DNA, you know, the surface of cylinder, it is held to, together by the interactions with the graphene membrane. So in this particular case, again, the, the rotation speed is about 60 million RPMs, which is pretty good. So one thing here to note is that in principle, it's beneficial to engineer a system to have as high of a water flux as possible. Because in this system, the water flux actually counteracts the pool of the electric field. So in principle, you can engineer a system that will have precisely zero axial force on the DNA molecule, but have a very high flux. And that very high flux translates into very high torques. So in principle, it's possible to engineer even more efficient systems than the one that I'm showing here. So we did some theory calculations to show that the torques that we produce in nanopore systems are strong enough to generate rotation of much larger loads, such as spherical particles or, or rod-like objects. And of course, the larger the rod, the more the drag it, it, it has and the less the speed of its rotation. But still, for a reasonable size system, we can obtain rotations in 100,000 RPMs at, at experimentally feasible electric fields. All right, so that was all nice. I see really, like, can we actually make something like that an experiment? And this was a collaboration with two leading labs in the field. So Henrik Dietz and, and Anna, they designed a turbine. So, so it's larger than a single DNA helix. It has a central shaft here with, with the blades. So blades are oriented at 35 degrees with the nanopore axis. Then we have nanopore expert, Keith Decker, and his lab in TU Delft. It's technologically difficult to realize a system using a single nanopore. So they used an array of pores. The pores are pretty large, 50 millimeters in diameter. And that's how the entire assembly looks like. You have a silicon nitride membrane, have a turbine, 
there is a leash here. The leash is to capture the, the assembly in the prescribed orientation. And then you have a road system. The road has been uh, beefed up here to make sure it doesn't buckle, because if it buckles, it will actually form a spinner, which, uh, which was reported by Decker and uh, Dietzlab in another publication. But in this particular case, the road is made stiff, so that doesn't happen. And that's kind of how it looks like. And of course, we're in simulation. So does it work? Yeah, it does. So this is how a typical experiment looks like. We apply electric field and the assembly is captured by the nanopore. So there's a die at, at the end of the road and we can monitor the rotation by looking at, at this nanopore array using a microscope. And this is kind of how it looks. The, the molecule gets captured and then you can actually see by a naked eye that it spins. And then once the experiment is done, we can inject it. And, uh, and gratifyingly, you know, it works as design. So left-handed turbine spins in, in, in the way it was expected to spin and the right-handed spins in the way it was expected to spin. We've used Frontera to simulate those systems. Again, this is all atom simulations, pretty large, about 4 million atoms where everything is described in atomistic resolutions. So we have not modeled the, the, the rod that holds it together, just the turbine. And uh, yeah, it spins, you know, we apply electric field spins very nicely. And if we analyze it, we do multiple simulations. Also, we do flow induced spinning. It kind of looks like a normal turbine, really. So at this point, we should have probably stopped and, and, and declare victory. But, you know, as always with science, there's this one little experiment that messes up everything. And so, so Shane, the first author, he, he's decided to do those experiments at high salt. Okay, so all of, all of the experiments before were at low salt. But at high salt, surprisingly, he saw that, that it actually spins the other way. We did the simulation, basically we mimicked this in our, in our supercomputer, and we also saw that it's spinning actually the other way under identical conditions. So the salt has this interesting ability to reverse the direction of motion, and it took us about a year to figure out why this actually happens. So the first kind of a thing to, to say is that theoretically, and this came from Christian, that theoretically, it should be possible to reverse the direction of rotation um, when you change the electrolyte conditions, because if you do the mass, it all comes down to this kind of ratio of electrophoretic mobility along the helix and against the helix versus the hydrodynamic mobility along the helix and against the helix. So this hydrodynamic mobility is actually something that can be estimated theoretically, but also simulated directly by just using a spring and pulling the DNA helix along its axis and, and normal. It's about 0.5 and it's insensitive to the electrolyte conditions. But one can also, but you know, to do it for, for electrophoretic mobility, one has to do a simulation. That's actually what, what we did. Took a piece of DNA, put it in an electrolyte, applied electric field, and then measured electrophoretic mobility of DNA relative to the solvent for both axial and orthogonal displacement. And we actually find it that there is actually a point of reversal where this ratio kind of becomes less than 0.5. And that means that this force, the axial force of the, on the DNA helix will change sign. That unfortunately also doesn't tell us anything about the mechanism. It just says that we can actually, that can actually happen. To figure out the mechanism, we did the following. We took one of the DNA helices and simulated the effective force, for example, force, and we apply electric field at different electrolyte conditions. And so what came out of it is kind of a little bit technical, so I'm not going to go into details. I'll just kind of show you this picture. So it actually is a reversal of the force has to do with how ions screen the DNA charge. So at low electrolyte, the DNA is screened by ions, but on average, the volume remains negatively charged. But if you go to high electrolyte concentration, kind of this screening overshoots the DNA charge. Basically, you have a negative DNA, and then the charge becomes positive a certain distance away from the DNA molecule, and then you know, it becomes zero far away from the DNA molecule. So that kind of a local overcharging of the molecule is why we see this force reversal. We 
we could prove in the molecular dynamic simulation by basically using this as a body force for our simulation so we can see reversal of the, of the field. So this kind of uh, brings me to the end of my talk. I want to finish up saying that, yeah, you can engineer many things out of DNA and DNA electromotors is just one thing that, that we could do. I personally wasn't sure if it's going to work with a DNA helix. There are many th arguments for why it would not work because we don't actually, we didn't know if the coupling between the flow and the groups of the DNA would be strong enough to produce detectable unidirectional motion at the background of random fluctuations, but we did find it. I also find it extremely rewarding working with experimentalists from around the world and special thanks to Henrik and Case for this wonderful collaboration on the DNA nanoturbine. We are hiring. If there's anyone interested in the postdoc, please send me an email. And I'd like to acknowledge all of the wonderful supercomputer time provided by supercomputer centers. So that's kind of our main resource and funding from various agencies. And thank you very much for your attention. Fantastic. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. Okay. Yeah, you have like lots of different clapping hands here in the background. We have also a bunch of questions already online. So without further ado, I'm just going to go ahead and, and have different people speak up if that's okay. Sure. Are you good with that? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Wonderful. The first one, we have Stefan. Stefan will be followed by Raymond Estumian, Tomo Sato, Micah, and then whoever raises their hand or is after the the loop. So Stefan, take it away, please. Hi, I hope you can hear me all right. Yeah, thanks for a great talk. Yeah, so I'm I'm wondering with these sort of nano turbine systems, do you have a feeling for whether it's momentum from the ions or the water flow that's actually caused the DNA to spin, which sounds unlikely to me, or is it more that it's that flow is actually rectifying random motion of the DNA itself, the helix itself? Okay, that's a really, really great question. I actually made a slide for it. I was hoping someone would ask. And it was the first question that was asked. Amazing. I kind of skipped over it in the interest of time, but I will show it right now. Okay. So, so first of all, full disclosure, I mean, we are probably not the, I mean, I know for sure we are not the first people to ask this question. Will DNA spin, right? If you... If you, if you have a current of ions around it. In reality, of course, it's ions that make the DNA spin, right? Because they are what transfers momentum to it. But that momentum transfer is mediated by water, which makes this momentum transfer inefficient. We actually report the simulation in, in, in one of the supplementary figures for the, for the paper. So what it is, is implicit solvent simulation of the same system with explicit ions. So basically we have a DNA molecule that is represented as a rigid body. And some time ago, we developed accurate description of ion DNA interactions for something completely unrelated, actually for nanopore sequencing. But basically, in this model, we could not have explicit water, but still have highly realistic interaction between ions and DNA and also realistic mobilities of ions and everything. So it's basically a system where we removed the action of water. And if we do that, of course, DNA spins and it actually spins much faster, at least five times more. Same with torques, basically, we are getting larger torques by a factor of five. And that is all because we are eliminating this inefficient momentum coupling that is mediated by water. So I hope I answered your question with this slide. Please let me know if I, if I haven't. Yeah, thank, I, I need to think about it a bit more because I think there might be a different interpretation of the data, which would suggest that by removing the water, you're actually accelerating the random thermal motion of the DNA, which is just allowing it to spin faster by that way. By no, 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 no. We made sure that it has exactly the same rotational drag coefficient. I mean, no, no, we, we like, okay. we, like we, that, we matched it one to one. The only difference was 
is we didn't have a mediator. So it has the same diffusion concept. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Wonderful. Next one up, we have Raymond. So I was wondering if you had done any studies looking at whether it depends on the current or on the electric field. So you can separate those out experimentally or theoretically, of course, by changing the ionic strengths. And yeah. you could have a constant, the same current, but with di different electric fields or the same electric field, but with different currents. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting idea. The, the first thing is, of course, if there's a DNA molecule and we just apply electric field, it, it's not going to spin, okay? Because there's nothing that would break the symmetry. And well, it's field. I think if it's if it's axial field, it's not going to do anything because it's you know it will you know there's nothing that would would, would there has to be something that will break the symmetry. Well, and, exactly. breaks the symmetry. Yeah, but 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 then when you have a you have a flow of ions, you know you know they bounce off the asymmetric surface, and that would break the symmetry and makes it spin you know, directionally. That's how I understand it. So. I think it won't spin in the electric field just by itself without any ions or water flux. Now, the question about the current is an interesting one because, because that's really in, in part what we answered in the second kind of part of my talk. I think it all kind of for the for the single DNA molecule oriented normal to the to the field, it all comes down to the water flux as the interface. For all realistic systems, you know, where we have water, the momentum is generated by water heating the the surface of the of the DNA. We actually for this paper we actually estimated directly what fraction because we could estimate how what molecules make contact with the surface of the DNA and what fraction of that is produced by direct ion heating or or, or water molecules and and the fraction of direct contact was actually very small. So it is mostly water flux. So as long as as long as the water flux produced by electric field is the same, I mean, regardless of the ion composition and so on, we expect to have the same torque and the same approximately the same rotational velocity. Yeah. I hope I answered. Sounds you. like he's yeah. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> sounds like he's good. Okay. Uh, next one, we have Tomo. Oh, hello. So my question was, how much of the energy do you expect to be lost in the DNA kind of wobbling? And if you can use a method to stiffen it, whether it's synthetic nucleotides that could possibly be cross-linked or like an external shell. And can you also use something like that to have slightly larger wings kind of stretching out of the nucleotide to increase the surface area with the water molecules. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think those are all great ideas. Actually, you know, one, one problem with using it in uh, experimental a single helix is that it's, it's somewhat pliable, you know, <laughs> it's well known that if you apply more than a hundred picanewtons to it, it will stretch and, and fall apart. Right. So you, so your axial force, that was actually why it took so long to demonstrate this nanopore rotation because you have to have enough flow. So that your axial force is not large enough to stretch the molecule because otherwise it's game over. So everything that one can do to stiffen the molecule definitely will help. We also thought, and that was actually Sean Douglas suggested, that you can also kind of decorate the molecule with a binding proteins, like for example, this tailing protein that forms like a much larger spiral around it. So that could actually kind of give it larger wings, so to say, and and generate larger torque. So there are quite a few possibilities with, you know, using DNA as a template, but, you know, you can build something on top of it, of the same chirality. There's possibility maybe silicated, you know, there's a technology for larger origami constructs to make it like more stiffer. So all of that is great. One thing is it shouldn't lose its charge. You know, if you want to use it as electromotor in a, in a, in a, in a normal away because you know that charge is what makes this solvent around it charged and that's why it kind of spins because you have the water flux 
Although if you just want to use it as, as an element, you know, like a nanofluidic system, so you can imagine that you have a neutral helix and, and you just have a pressure difference to produce water flux. I think that would work. That would work as well. So then it actually doesn't need to have a charge and all kind of synthetic constructs are, should work. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, sorry for the na naivete, but yeah, it seems like DNA is great because it's flexible and that way you can create a lot of structures. But if you can, yeah, guide other stiffer components using that base structure, if you just had a negatively charged amino acids being able to attach to the nucleotides as wings, right, then it would still preserve the kind of the negative charge and have a larger kind of, yeah, structure to kind of capture it. So. Yeah, just yeah, yeah. yeah. There, there are quite a few biomolecules that form helical filaments around DNA, so that could be one thing to explore next. Cool. All right, thank you. Wonderful. Next up, we have Micah. You might have already answered this, and I just missed it. So, and if so, feel free to give a very brief answer. There's a big divergence in the R a divergence between the different RPMs. You got like 760 million and a billion. What was yeah. the cause? That why, why was that such a wide divergence? It just depends on, on how much drag there is and, and what was the water flux. So the highest number of RPM was for a system where we had a, just a, a DNA molecule in solution. And the large number was because it's just, a, a, it's just two terms of DNA, right? And it's bulk electrolyte so you have kind of high water flux around it so once you put in a nanopore your hydrodynamic profile you basically will have a smaller fluxes and and that's why your shear force of the water flux will be smaller and that's why you'll have a smaller rotation rate additionally once you start adding you know t-bars and other things you know they have their own hydrodynamic drag and that will also slow down the 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 speed with which the, the molecule spins. So in fact, we have this theoretical curve that shows how the theoretically the rotational speed will depend on the size of the load. And of course, the bigger the load, the the, the slower the, the whole assembly spins. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Awesome. We're really going through lots of Q&A here. And next up, we have Kriyan. Thanks, Allison. Okay, so my question is, I have kind of two of them. The first is, which kinds of simulations are you using to try and unravel and understand this? You know, what level of theory? basically. And the reason I asked the question is my next question, which is that in the flagellar motor and the electron transport mitochondrial motors, it is not just the bumping of water molecules like in a water wheel that is making these things spin. It is detailed electronic configuration changes with electron pumps, proton pumps, ATP is involved and all these things. So I guess what I'm saying is, can you try and reconnect the work you're doing to the molecular physics of the work that flagellar motor and electron transport chain motors? Yeah, engage? sure. Many thanks for this question. Yeah, I mean, first, 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 first things first, we do all atom molecular dynamics simulation for most of the parts. So we have every molecule of solvent, every ion explicitly represented. I actually used this method when I started in my postdoc here in Backman 20 years ago to study the biological motor, FO ATP synthase. And uh, so I'm of course familiar that the principle, the operating principle is completely different. It's a Brownian ratchet. You basically have a stochastic motion and you just bias the direction of the of the field. So in that sense, the principle that we demonstrated for DNA helix rotation is different from what is used in biological molecular motors. In fact, it's similar to what we have at the macro scale, which kind of makes it exciting because possibly we can also adapt other micro scale design at the nanoscale. It seems to work, right? 
But uh, coming back to flagellum motor, you know, that, that is a huge system, of course, very interesting and exciting to look at it with a, with a computational microscope. It's probably at the limit, maybe slightly beyond the limit of what one can do right now. And there's the difficulties are, of course, that you have this proton transfer that is, I think structurally, we still don't know enough to, to tell where exactly those protons go. I mean, there have been a few, few recent structures for the flagellum motor and putting it all together is, is really exciting. And maybe, maybe we'll do it. Maybe, maybe someone else will do it, but definitely you'll hear about it within the next five years. But what I mean, I, I appreciate your answer, but what I mean is that the, it is the electronic structure, not just the nuclear geometry, you know, it's not just molecular mechanics that's working in these things. These things have evolved to leverage the energies and configurations, multi-electron configurations of biomolecules, ATP, protons, electrons, proteins, active sites. I mean, there's so much going on. It's in the biological systems, it's not primarily just mechanical banging around of thermodynamic water molecules, all of that, of course, plays a role. There is electronic configuration changes that happen in these systems. And what I'm wondering is, are you just, do you want to make something that doesn't leverage that? Or do you want to just like kind of isolate that and because it's too hard or am I missing something and you're already working with it? So for... Yes and no. I would say for FOF1 ATP synthase, yes, there is definitely an electronic contribution in the in the sense that the chemical reaction happens, right? Like for for bacterial, you know, for proton driven, you could say that maybe electronic configuration matters because you have to protonate and protonate those aspartates in the, in the C-ring. But, you know, there's an analogous system that works on sodium ions, you know, sodium ATPase. There, there you don't have protons. It's just really a motion of an ion that, that basically forms a complex, and then, and then that basically makes it neutral so it can escape the, the membrane. It's very mechanistic. I think at that level, the description is satisfactory. Of course, if you were to make a complete description of the respiratory chain, you know, starting from foodstuff and, and separating electrons from, and, you know, ending up with, with, with oxygen fixation, you know, that part definitely requires electronic structure calculations because, you know, the electron transfer by itself is, is, is dependent on it. But, you know, FOF F1 ATP haze doesn't have electron transfer. At, at, at best, it has this, uh, the proton transfer and, you know, the chemical reaction, of course, in, in, involves change of the electronic configuration, but you can probably approximate it as before and after state because there is structure for it. You can also mechanically drive it, you know, so it's possible. Yeah. Thanks. Great stuff. Love the work. And last question from Abhishek. Hello, Alec. Hi, so, <laughs> great stuff. So, if I may not ask, invite you to, th is it, is it, okay to think about the efficiencies of the systems or how should I think about the efficiencies of a motor? Like the productive work is the kinetic energy of in a, in a given direction and the input is possibly the, the, the energy from the electric field. You add them together. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So here it's actually straightforward because, mm -hmm. you know, if you know the torque that is generated, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you know, basically what's your energy efficiency is. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you and know how much, much yeah i mean in a simulation you know how much energy you put in at every, exactly yeah and, yeah. And, and you know how much energy you get out from the rotation exactly. right yeah and everything that is dissipated is dissipated you know that's basically how we came up with 0.1 percent which actually was suggested mm -hmm. to me by by alex I, I have an acknowledgement in the paper so that was not something that we came up with that he recommend it that we do it mm -hmm. and did it. But I think I think it's in that case it was very, very straightforward to to estimate mm -hmm. what it was just basic physics. Yeah. So it's just like 0.1 percent and then that's the efficiency. Because point one percent we didn't do any optimization or whatsoever. Probably we can get to one percent maybe. I see. Maybe <laughs> if we define those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And is that direction dependent? Is the hysteresis to go clockwise versus anti-clockwise? Will no, there's run. no hysteresis because if you switch off the field, it just performs Brownian motion. 
and and okay and the other way around if you if you change the direction of the field then uh, yeah yeah <laughs> okay, well, they'll make a pump out of it yeah 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 but, but is there any merit to make it let's say if you if you make it 50 percent somehow magical will that be something that is in, of interest or will that be no something? of course of interest yeah because you know one one of potential applications is in this you know blue energy generation again this is something that I don't mm. know if you've had the person talking about it, but the mm. idea, you know, if you have salt water and the fresh water, okay, it's, you'll have a flow. I see. And the question is, you know, how do you harness this into something? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but you can think of ways to harness it if you can produce rotation. In that sense, you know, having high efficiency spinners is, is could be one way to do it. I see. Okay, oh, that was my question. Okay, thanks, Alec. Jeff. Yeah. With two minutes left, I want to ask, or like maybe close out with the obligatory question of if people are excited about the work that you do, and as you can tell, they are, what can they do to help you and your group really make progress? I know that you already, you know, had a slide up at the, uh, at the end of, you know, open positions and so forth. But if there's mm -hmm. anything, you know, that you just want to leave people with as we close out, then now is a great time to reiterate that. Well we are we are very open to collaborations. I enjoy working with experimentalists for building systems. We always learn something even even if say we fail to reproduce something or something like that. I specifically like projects where experimentalists can take our design and test you know verify us whether we're correct or not. It's always something interesting comes out of it. So I'm open to collaborations. If someone wants to collaborate, please send me an email. Thank you. Wonderful. Hey, thank you so, so much for joining us. This was really exciting. Thanks everyone for your great questions. And yeah, I'll see you very soon for the next one. And we'll be out with the video of this in the next week or so. So thank you so, so much. That was yeah, a real joy. <laughs> Thanks thank everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.